with really some thoughts from members of the philanthropic community about um, public policy and engagement happening in our state. We didn't want you to think that only folks in Ohio were engaged. Um, clearly, uh, there's lots of activity happening here in our state. Um, we're very pleased to be joined today by three current and former philanthropic leaders to discuss how their organizations have been engaged in public policy in Arizona. And they're going to discuss some really specific efforts that they've been engaged in that um, are of tremendous variety um, related to public policy. And they'll talk about some of their successes, their challenges, and hopefully through this you'll get some new thinking about the possibilities for your own investments in this area. I'm joined by um, Jack Jewett, President and CEO of the Flynn Foundation, Dr. Judy Mraz, President and CEO of Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust, and Jody Liggett, who was until recently the CEO of the Arizona Women's Foundation. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. So, um, Jack, I'm going to start with you. Um, more than a decade ago, the Flynn Foundation began an ambitious effort to create the biosciences roadmap for our state. Um, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that effort, its successes, and how public policy engagement was an important part of the roadmap. I think that uh, philanthropic organizations have uh, it's an open field in terms of engagement and, and public policy. Uh, so now to the question of, of the biosciences. Um, when, when Grady, Grady said a couple of things and our last speaker also uh, reinforced it. Uh, in Grady, in, in, in Grady language, he said, pick stuff that matters and stick with it. Uh, that really resonates with me. Well, the stuff in this instance is the biosciences. So 10 years ago, uh, the Flynn Foundation made some major decisions because we have always been involved as one of our major program areas board and, and through the leadership of John Murphy made a decision to put all of our chips that were related to health care in the biosciences. Now that just didn't happen. Uh, the Mattel Institute conducted about an 18 month study and, uh, and, and as a result of that study uh, we mapped out as a foundation uh, and made that stick with the pledge that we would commit uh, to 10 years uh, of, of investments. Uh, and that investment turned out to be $50 million uh, over 10 years. I, I view that as an example of punching above our weight class because our size, uh, many would think that, gosh, Flynn, you know, that's a lot of money for anybody, but it was a lot of money for Flynn, but that stick with it was uh, affected, and here we are 10 years later about to celebrate in December uh, 10 years before the roadmap, but it started with a, a 18 month review, uh, we retained the consultancy of the Mattel Institute. And uh, once they helped to really chart a pathway and the board made that commitment, uh, the next <coughs> step was to create a strategic plan. Uh, we created it and we have been following it ever since. Uh, but the, the key, in, in addition to our mission, which is to improve the quality of life in Arizona, to benefit future generations. We've coined, and, and I believe it was Walt Placilla, Dr. Placilla with the uh, Mattel Institute, who observed the Flynn that we have five, uh, five C's. These are the five C's of the state of Arizona, the, the Flynn five C's. It starts with convene. Uh, it starts with this facility that provides these kinds of convening opportunities. And then the, we focus on collaboration. How can we foster uh, collaboration, convening in a safe place to have conversations, and then really collaborate? And, and as we collaborate, and some of these terms have some political volatility now, when we talk about consensus building. I call it coming to terms, finding solutions. But, but as you collaborate and, and, and build a consensus, and then for a philanthropic organization, the word leverage was used. Uh, we use the word catalytic. How can our investments and how can our long-term commitments be catalytic to make things happen? And then finally, we pride ourselves in communication. Let's see. So how can we uh, really effectively communicate what we're doing? 
those five C's were, were applied to our engagement in the biosciences. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, the, the input that is one of the reasons that the public policy elements of the, the roadmap were feasible to put into action. Uh, we created this roadmap steering committee made up of uh, interested people from the academy, from business, from science, from healthcare, all walks of life from all over the state, leaders vitally interested in the biosciences. That committee was established, administered by the Flynn Foundation, uh, and every meeting was in this room up until the one last week when we went to Tucson uh, for a meeting in Ventana, uh, attended by uh, really key leaders in biosciences from all over the state. Uh, so the, uh, from the early days of the uh, policy has always been uh, key. Your question also talks about what are the successes. Uh, the roadmap, you know, we, we, we catalog this and we report out every year how we're doing, how we're doing against plan. And we do that at hosted, Flynn hosted lunches in Tucson and Phoenix and Flagstaff. So uh, those successes, uh, let me just list them. Uh, growth in the industry, in the bioscience industry in terms of jobs and firms, growth of federal research grants and this uh, increased competitiveness of Arizona research institutions, attraction of top bioscience talent to Arizona, beginning with where a lot of our investment uh, resides, and that is in TGEN and, and uh, one of the global leaders in biosciences and genetics, uh, Jeff Trent. Uh, we've also run CPAP, Ray Moosley, uh, uh, Eric Ryman, a great Alzheimer's researcher, others, uh, that attraction of top talent is absolutely uh, critical and, and uh, we like to talk about that. Uh, and then, of course, the research facilities and TGEN uh, comes to mind. Uh, development of incubators and accelerators statewide to help turn research innovations into, into companies. Uh, launching a coordinated statewide STEM education plan. So all of that uh, ties to public policy. Uh, I asked the question about this, uh, what, what did she call it? It always makes me nervous. Issuing reports and then having a mic for six months. And so I ran out and got a public policy principles document that we produced. And I knew we were on safe ground, but that stuff makes me nervous. Uh, and so we have a public policy document that guides uh, leaders in public policy, namely legislators. If you are interested in the biosciences, here are some questions. Uh, that you might consider in formulating legislation in the areas covered by the roadmap, STEM education, infrastructure, uh, incubating. What policies can you put in place uh, that would impact bioscience and move the state forward? Well, where's the legislation, Jack? Well, that's your job. These are the questions. So you've given them sort of a menu, basically. Exactly. Exactly. So let me stop. Judy, the um, Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust has a wide array of portfolio of investments. And one of them, however, is, um, as I mentioned before, is on strengthening literacy for young children. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that effort and how you're partnering with government um, to shape policy and practice in this area? Sure. Um, well, I want to say one thing about Jack's presentation, and I want to make one disclaimer, and then I'll answer your question. Um, <laughs> okay. so, so I would simply say that I think the Flynn Foundation is the national model in terms of impact um, over a sustained period of time in a very focused area. Um, I was at a meeting of the Center for Effective Philanthropy a couple of years ago where there were foundations like RWJ that were lifted up as examples in public policy and in strategic investments, and John Murphy uh, Jack's predecessor was right there on that same panel. So I think we've got a lot to be really proud of as far as strategic philanthropy linked directly with public policy right here. Okay, here's the disclaimer. Mary Lee Del Pra, my colleague, is sitting right over there and everything I'm going to say, she told me to say. <laughs> and she's the only one who can give you really thoughtful um, 
sort of answers, except for one piece that I'm going to talk about toward the end, which is working with the board and moving them toward a comfort level with public policy, which I think goes to Eva's points first. So we, the Piper has been working in early literacy since the very beginning of 2001, 2002. We made a big bet on trying remedial um, reading uh, in after school hours. It was a really big bet with Harvard and Tufts and it was an abominable failure. We've been constantly looking for ways and some interesting things came about. Number one, um, and this goes back to Jack's sort of point about this space, and now Piper has its space we didn't used to, and it has really, I think, magnified our effectiveness in the community to have that space. But Mary Lee and others, and when I talk about an early literacy effort, let me just say that Piper is just one partner. In this. I mean, we've got our piece, Helios has theirs in uh, training early education teachers. You saw that enormous grant that went out to the U of A yesterday. United Way has mobilized the entire community um, to work in the area of build and systems building, uh, Arizona Community Foundation. So, I mean, we're just one part of this. Um, but in any case, we began to convene people and that safe space really matters and it became clear particularly and, and this this convening of early education folks both in government out of government foundation people uh, child care providers all of that has been going on for a while but what became very apparent when the race for the top um, sort of work went on was that there were gaps and literacy was one of them and that there was no agency, whether you're talking first things first or the Department of Education, anywhere that had a literacy, somebody who really owned literacy. So here was this gap. And then the question became, well, so where should it be? And in this room, I'll tell you the Department of Education said, don't put it here. Because if you do, it's viewed as only the Department of Education. If you put it somewhere else, where, you know, you're, you're, you get involved in this sort of Byzantine world of bureaucracy. So the decision was, yes, we needed a state literacy director. Yes, we needed a roadmap. Hear that term again, a statewide roadmap for literacy. And so, and get this real clear, this is not Piper's person, okay? We're paying for this, but this is an independent person. I hope that um, all of you will have a chance to meet Terry Clark. She came from California. She is just dynamite. I mean, she is just, I mean, she is moving faster. They move fast in California. <laughs> on the freeway, on public policy, whatever. So she's just zipping right along. The Piper trustees committed to three years of her salary. Um, and we're also housing her, but that she's, she's not a Piper employee. And I want to make that clear because the point of this is she is the one who's bringing everyone together, but she's an independent agent in a sense. And I don't think anyone sees her as representing any particular constituency, but rather as simply that one who's going to knit together and help plan what is what we hope will be by the end of the first year, the plan, and year two and three implementation. Um, where it goes beyond that, we'll just have to see. Now, uh, as I say, if you've got any questions, Mary Lou's sitting right over there. Uh, let me talk for a moment uh, about boards and public policy. And I think Eva's findings are exactly right. If you had said to our board, 2001, 2002, 2003. So, is Piper going to be involved in public policy? There would have been a, a real pause, and the answer would be, you know, we've got six areas that we focus on, and we're stretched really thin, and we've got to be very strategic. And they would have said no, but they would not have nodded their heads and said, absolutely, we'll be right out there. And I think, 
public policy has an amorphous, vague sort of feel, particularly as politics has become more and more partisan and gridlock has become more and more the case. You know, foundation trustees have a legitimate concern in saying, you know, do we really want to put our money and and we're a private foundation, so we're not going to be in that lobbying space, but in the advocacy space. Um, but I think the key that I would say that has really moved the, the Piper Board um, is that every one of our engagements in public policy have been embedded in a very specific strategy. If we had simply said that we were going to be involved in advocacy and public policy in early childhood education, period, I can tell you, and, and given some sort of vague operational grant, as worthy as that might have been to that organization, I don't think it would have passed sort of the, the criteria that our board very sort of systematically looks at. So I would say to you that, that for us at least, the way we've been able to do this is to make sure that it is grounded very specifically within, a, within the initiative. It is very targeted, very strategic, and in our case, it has an end date, or at least from the moment it has an end date. We'll see um, two and a half years from now. Thank you. Very good. So Jody, um, you're next. <laughs> so you were engaged uh, as part of um, the Arizona Foundation for Women, um, Arizona Women's Foundation, in a very ambitious effort to change public policy in a really direct way. Um, your organization worked openly to change public policy related to payday lending, and were quite successful. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that effort and how you worked towards ending regressive payday loan practices. Well, there was a, a long tail on that particular project, and of course there were many, many parties involved, um, but we did play a, a very visible role. Um, I was fortunate in that regard um, because we had already established a history at the Arizona Foundation for Women. Um, AFW was founded by a group of local female philanthropists and businesswomen, and they really focused on domestic violence almost exclusively for many years. Worked, it's not a family foundation, it's a 501c3, so they work incredibly hard every year to raise um, their, the money that they grant out into the community. So these are really hard fought investments um, that they make in vulnerable women. And along that road, they realized um, first they needed to do a lot of research so that they were making wise investments. Um, and then about the time I came along a little bit after, there, we realized that um, this research really can have two purposes and that the, the investments that they're making, these are you know, safety net investments are really a public and private partnership. Um, our whole system of care for vulnerable people, whether they're victims of domestic violence or child abuse or the homeless, um, there are government investments and there are private investments in that system and it doesn't work, you know, when, when either one is, is um, withdrawn. So we had some early experience, my board was very courageous in answering kind of the staff's call um, to weigh in on some specific domestic violence funding issues and we had a men's group who played a pivotal role in that. So we already had some practice. Um, being active in public policy, then our research really carried us forward into expanding our area of focus um, into all sorts of poverty and vulnerability issues surrounding the women that we really cared about and were trying to help. And sort of at the end, we wound up with safety, health, and economic security for women, those being you know, the three things that especially victims of domestic violence need, but you know, all vulnerable women struggling to raise families in our community. So, you know, we published a research report, I think in 2007, um, on the status of women, showing, you know, sort of a mixed bag, but really kind of a, a grim situation for vulnerable women. And then a year later, here comes a ballot initiative, the payday loan industry, 
um, pushing a set of reforms um, for payday loans. It was a very cynical campaign, really, because their um, statutory authority was about to sunset in 2010. So they were pushing something that looked like consumer protection and reform. I think a lot of us were just sort of outraged by it as, as citizens. Um, but then grant makers and service providers were really concerned because there was a lot of evidence. Um, AARP was very good at, at getting research out there. These payday lenders target women leaving welfare and vulnerable elderly women. Women specifically are targeted by this industry. And for those of you who don't know or don't remember, you know, these are the guys who charge 400% interest. This is debt that you will never, ever escape from. They don't expect you to escape from it. They're gonna make their money over a period of a couple of years until you get figured out and walk away from bad debt. And so do they, but they've already made 10 times at least their investment. So it's, it's not a reputable industry. Um, we had broad consensus on that. Um, but the advocacy group that was fighting this um, was not local. They had help from local AARP, but they were really outgunned by a very sophisticated um, and uh, well-funded industry. And I was very proud of United Way um, for stepping up and speaking out and our local chambers. And really there was just a groundswell, but you know, we had had Within months of this campaign unfolding in November, we had just had a summit on poverty um, and had gone through kind of in detail, you know, the, the investments that were needed, the state of the safety net in Arizona, and you know, here you've got people who've made a bad situation worse and wanting to extend their reign for another 10 years. So we just felt it was incumbent upon us. Um, I know we're gonna have some follow-up. By the way, uh, you know, we should have used a wooden stake the first time because <laughs> while the ballot initiative was defeated overwhelmingly, and these folks spent $14 million in Arizona to try and pass this initiative. Um, it was defeated by overwhelming margins in every district of the state, so it was a huge victory for the community in beating back something like that. They were back from the grave and back here in 2010 um, a little smart, a lot smarter actually. They had a very good strategy. They may not have been able to fool citizens, but they could go to the legislature <laughs> and have a run at those people um, with, with much, they got a lot more traction. And it was very frightening actually. It, it really looked like they were gonna do it. They're extremely shrewd. They worked both sides of the aisle, put out a lot of bad information, trotted out their employees who looked very sympathetic and you know, who's on the other side of this? Um, do struggling single mothers have the time to come down and testify at a legislative hearing in the middle of the day, which by the way, these tricky guilt bills get pushed all the way to the end of session. So I'm not kidding, you're likely to have a hearing maybe in the middle of the night um, towards the end of session. The bill will disappear and pop up on a striker that nobody knows about. I mean, you all know what I'm talking about. It's, it's dirty pool. And that's when you need to have folks working on this who understand how that system works, more, you know, lobbying professionals, frankly. Um, and then also people like AARP and United Way and the Arizona Foundation for Women who were trusted messengers. You know, we didn't really have a dog in the fight other than to protect vulnerable citizens in Arizona, and I think we all, all of us took our local credibility to that fight and eventually prevailed. So I know there's gonna be a follow-up, but it's important, you know, I know private family foundations can't do lobbying at all, but for the rest of us, um, it is important to, as Kenda said, you know, focus on advocacy, kind of for the bulk of your activities, but you're doing that so that you can save some bullets for when you really need them. You might have to lobby. There might be no other choice at some point. So you gotta save your bullets, but then you need to pull the trigger when you have to defend yourself or someone who's vulnerable. So 
you all gave very different examples of how you can be engaged in public policy. You have everything from Jody being out there, being really direct in terms of pushing some public policy issues. Jack was sort of a long-term engagement. Judy describing really a partnership with government and sort of filling the holes and where the system is not working currently. Judy, you talked a little bit about how you sort of brought your board along and how you think about engaging them in terms of meaningful conversations on public policy or at least how to, how to get them to where they need to go to be able to make those types of investments. Jack and Jody, I'm just curious about how you have those conversations with your with your boards and how you can help them think about public policy more fully. Uh, well, the Flynn Foundation is blessed with uh, just a superb board. And, uh, so on these matters of public policy, uh, well, it, it's always a flight to quality. Whatever the Flynn Foundation does, whatever our board approves, their due diligence is, are we going to do this really well? Have we covered all the bases? And that's why we always start, not with the ready, fire, aim mentality, but really solid research uh, and a very deliberative process uh, to an, a fully engaged board uh, that, that wants to be true to the mission. So an example would be, uh, you know, in addition to the biosciences, uh, where we have very specific measures and we've stepped up our game in terms of public policy uh, in the last few years by more fully engaging public uh, officials uh, with our education program. As a former elected official, I, I take the prerogative of, uh, of observing uh, what it is to be an elected official and, and you know, begin with um, the, 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 the focus of the NAT, uh, and, and that is public officials are dealing with hundreds of issues and how do you get them to focus on the complexity of the issues like the biosciences. So we, uh, we engage fully elected officials, they're part of our steering committee and, and so forth and, and so we're able to execute uh, on behalf of the board on that basis. The most recent example I guess of a new program where uh, we, we began with solid research and, and engaged board is our fourth program area of civic leadership and creating uh, with a, another statewide philanthropic partner, the Brown Foundation, the Arizona Center for Civic Leadership, uh, the Flynn, Flynn Brown Leadership Academy. Uh, this, was, this was treacherous ground because this was a more direct engagement uh, in, uh, on issues related to the intersection of politics and policy. So how does a private foundation tread into this territory of politics. Uh, and that required a great deal of thought over an extended period of time and a very solid design uh, and, 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 a, and, and, and the board asking all of the right questions. And we came with a program that was well designed. The issues that we thought could be problems uh, uh, required absolute transparency so that we are not viewed as uh, an organization with an ax to grind. It's not bipartisan, it is nonpartisan, it is objective, it is data-driven, and we hammer that into the curriculum. That's a result of a board that knows how to perform their governance mission along with a highly dedicated and professional staff that knows how to execute. I think um, relationships are important and having those, a relationship of trust with your board of directors and then with your external stakeholders is really critical. And, um, you know, I very often focus on the need to be nimble and the need to activate in a crisis like the one I described, but um, Jack's points are so well taken because we would not have been able to do that at that time, if we had, if the staff, me, <laughs> if I hadn't built internal credibility with our founder, with our board, with our donors, um, that we were not going to be reckless 
um, with regard to advocacy and public policy work, that it was part of an integrated approach. Uh, you know, we all like to talk about moving the needle and social change and community impact. Um, we created a culture at the foundation that there were three legs on the stool. There were research, public policy, uh, and, and grant making. We're making investments, government's making investments, we're all trying to make good decisions based on fact so that we do the longer term, more thoughtful approaches. We had an excellent relationship. Um, I know Ken just talked about advocacy at regulatory agencies. Um, we had an excellent relationship with the Department of Economic Security and cooperated them in forming, with them in formulating their policies on women exiting welfare and how they were going to do. Um, that created a lot of trust in the executive branch during the Dep Napolitano administration. I know they relied on our research and advice, not on specific pieces of legislation, but on general approaches. So we had already built that credibility externally, but also our board was walking through this experience of, you know, dipping their toe in the waters and experiencing a success in that you know, they weren't on the front page of the newspaper for violating IRS regulations the next day, that um, they gradually got more and more uh, comfortable with the work that we were doing. And then, like I said, it did give us the ability when we really needed to, um, to act quickly in an emergency. So Jack, um, we heard a little bit today about the challenges for many funders in terms of engaging in public policy in that um, public policy involvement is sometimes difficult to measure, yet I'm, I'm really struck by when you talk about the Biosciences Roadmap, how measurable your activities are and how measurable your successes have been. Can you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are on measurement and investments in public policy? Um, I, I think probably on, on the, the way the roadmap is structured very precise strategic direction and we're measuring every year uh, on that plan and we're reporting out. And so, in fact, we have a bookmark uh, and I'll bring it down for those who might want it. And it has, it's a, it's a bookmark, it's just a very, well, it's a bookmark, but on it are all the successes, the most recent successes in terms of jobs and salaries and new firms and research and all of the, all of that. Uh, that, so, so those are easy to measure, really, and we report it at, at these annual luncheons. Uh, uh, we have candidate forums, uh, and, and we, we present, uh, you know, kind of an intro to the biosciences in terms that, uh, that candidates can understand. The elected officials, they come here, some come to our steering committee, we have an annual reception, and what we're seeing is we, you know, an old fundraising Say it, but there are two ways to raise money. You dig them out of the foxholes and you mow them down on the beaches. But you try to, it takes an aggressive effort. It takes an aggressive effort to get policymakers involved. And so that's, you know, that's kind of telling the message overall. And then for those who are really interested, uh, kind of capturing them and, and making them quasi experts. So it, it's hard work, but it, it, it can be done, and particularly these messages that resonate. And I believe that policymakers are now seeing that this isn't just an election year shtick that they need for three months, but this, this could be the profile for their future as well uh, in, in being advocates for solid policy. Space and 
supporting public awareness for, for now a number of years. So I, I wouldn't say that there's an absolute finite date on everything you do. And, and I would well imagine that, that there is an organic process in, in this effort, just as there have been in other efforts we've made, where, yes, this is this investment, but then it opens up opportunities of another sort subsequently. And, and so I think as long as you're clear about what the goals are, as long as you have set some kind of evaluation process of tracking progress, monitoring it, and not simply saying it's either up or it's down and that's it, then I think you can you can work with it and and it absolutely is a long process. So finally I'm going to ask the three of you a question. Um, I'm really struck by the great examples you've provided in terms of your leadership and public policy. And I consider the three of you as leaders in our community. Given that assertion, I was wondering what you think the role for philanthropy is in general in terms of community leadership in the realm of public policy and what we as funders should be doing, we should be doing something more in that realm. Well, um, and I, I do want to put a footnote on everything I say. I know that you know among grant makers there are distinctions in, in what people can do, but I'll just speak to um, in the nonprofit sector, you know, between the community of funders and service providers, um, because I've kind of uh, straddled that world throughout my career, I, I really want to stress the obligation of funders to enter into this where they can and where they can bring their boards along with them. I, I believe it's an absolute obligation. And it goes back to that upstream, downstream analysis. I mean, do you, are you really making investments in this community to make a change? Or are you making investments so your donors and your board feel good? Because if you're really trying to make a change, then you need to very often weigh in and align public policies toward your and the community's goals. Or stop really horrible things from happening that are going to undo all the good that you've spent 10 years investing to try and do. So I really do think it's an obligation um, of funders to, where they can, um, prudently enter into this field. And I'll tell you, um, the service providers are tired of carrying this burden by themselves because they have been for a long time. Um, you know, I've had folks make, make the comment to me like, oh, I can't, I don't know how you go down and talk to those people at the Capitol. Well, I'll tell you, sometimes it's not very fun. Um, and the folks in the rest of the nonprofit world are sick of doing this all by themselves and taking those slings and arrows. So I think really, um, I say our sector, I'm not in it anymore, but our sector has a real obligation and an opportunity um, to step up. The return on investment is absolutely amazing. Um, you know, the example that was cited earlier, I didn't speak about now, but you know, for maybe 40 hours of my time and some convening and, you know, hours of other folks' time, we got $6 million invested in Arizona's domestic violence shelter system and, you know, for a brief shining moment, ended turnaways in this state. That is absolutely phenomenal return on investment. So it's, it's worth it. You should do it and it's a good investment. Yeah, I actually think foundations have been playing a pretty significant role the last few years in this space. And so while we can always do more, I think there was a time where the business community really pulled back. And if you saw who was spearheading education, you'd look at Helios, you'd look at, you know, a lot that was going on there, I think, in, in uh, early childhood, there have been a whole group of foundations that have been working. Um, I, I think the foundations have been looked to in these last few years to have a voice, to be that bully pulpit, but to be the honest broker that this community is badly needed. And while we can always do more, I actually think we've done some significant things that, that we can all be proud of.
Here's what I don't think we can do. I don't think we can be out there on every single issue. And I think we've got to be very strategic about which battles we fight, which issues we take and lift up and then put every ounce of our efforts and our and so that to me, because I mean, there are times, I mean, all of us in this room know that, you know, all you do is walk through a day in Arizona and you see, you know, a dozen egregious, unspeakable conditions. And so how do you pick? And which ones can your foundation, in concert with others, in concert with nonprofits, mobilize public opinion that to me is always the question. Well, I, I mean, attempt to build on what Judy said because I think the future in Arizona, particularly in the 21st century, in terms of, of uh, filling what some would say are voids, uh, you know, the, the, the business community is different than it was, the, the makeup of the state is different. The philanthropic community, for me, is where the action is particularly in public policy. And the, uh, the investments that, that philanthropies make in the cultivation of human resources and human talent and leadership uh, is absolutely vital to the success of the state. Judy has a program in uh, Leaders in Nonprofit. Uh, we have our, our program that is uh, uh, really starting to catch on. Uh, focused, no commentary on past or existing leadership in, in public policy, but really with a, an eye towards what will the future uh, public policy leadership look like in the state of Arizona? How will decisions be made? How will solutions to problems be formulated? And how can we, in this fog of political, you know, I mean, we're, we're in all these metaphors here, more like, but, uh, uh, but it, in, in public policy, in the intersection of politics and policy, it's, it's pretty brutal out there. It's called a democracy, uh, but it has gotten maybe a little bit out of whack, some would say. So philanthropies are that long-term focus, uh, uh, brokers, fair brokers, objective brokers, to the extent that we don't have an axe to grind, except that we're trying to make the future better than it is today. We're focused on future of Arizona. This is where it is in philanthropy. And I, you know, I, I just pinch myself every day that the Flynn Foundation Board handed me the key to this candy store. And it, it has been just a, it, it's not a labor of love, it is just love. 